Um, number one thing is anatomy, trying to find key points. Key is your CT scan. Um, you know, I sometimes think I'm really, really good and I have the CT scan for a basic surgery and I don't open it on my laptop and I start the surgery because I remember the patient's stuff. And about two thirds of the time I'm like, oh, okay, let me go get that scan and open it up. So open the scan right away. It's nice to, if you are doing multiple cases for the day to actually go through your scans the day before. How many people have a scanner in their office? So few, um, so that's a nice thing to do. Basically, if you're operating on Wednesday, just go to your scanner, take an anatomy diagram, draw it like you would see right here, or you can open images from your um, radiology facility. It's nice to do it the night before. Use a three by five card. This is Jones, right frontal sinus, exposed anterior artery, type three frontal cell. I'm going to take down the maxillary sinus, leave the ethmoid bulla in place, dissect in front of the ethmoid bulla, get into her frontal recess. That should take me about 35 minutes. Put that on the card, have your little cartoon, then do the next one for your next surgery. Get to the operating room, you got three cards, and you've got those three cards for those three surgeries, and you're kind of ready to go. Um, knowing the anatomy of the lateral nasal wall is what you're going to be doing. Even when a patient has a normal CT scan, um, open that scan up, whether it's your patient or a patient that is uh, referred to you, and look for abnormal stuff. Just look for stuff that you go, oh, look at that. Mrs. Jones, did you ever get hit in the eye? Oh, yeah, I fell off my bicycle when I was a kid. Uh, is that me? I'm, I'm not touching anything. So look through your normal scans because you'll see that there is really cool anatomy there. Another thing with normal scans is sometimes the disease will progress and five years later that normal scan will have a disease that has now covered the orbital blowout fracture or covered the anterior ethmoid artery. And if you had taken a note of that or if the radiologist had taken a note of that and told us that that was abnormal, when you actually operate on the patient, it would be nice to have that information there. There are four lamellae that we'll be walking through when we do sinus surgery. And um, when I taught residents and fellows, I used to tell them four steps, four boxes. And quite often, we try to create tunnels. We have this vision of like, I've got to get to the sphenoid, and I'm going to drive myself from front to back straight through into the sphenoid. And, um, and that's not really how we should try to do sinus surgery. We should dissect the first box, then move on to the next box, and the next box, and the next box. And we'll show you that in the lab, where if you're leaving a lot of stuff on the sides, leaving stuff against the basal lamella, against the medial orbital wall, that's just going to ooze and ooze and ooze and keep on messing with you. While if you dissect out the boxes one by one, you'll get there very efficiently. First thing we look for is the unsnap process then the ethmoid bulla, then the base lamella of the middle terminate, and then the anterior wall of the sphenoid. And so here's our first patient of the day. And that keeps on going in and out. How, how can we stop it from flashing in and out? Or is it just me hung, hung over from last night? Okay, I'll just keep, talk, keep on talking. It's better over here. Okay, so um, the first thing we're gonna look for, yeah, it's gonna kill me. The first thing we're gonna look for, you come on in and look for your unsnet process. And a complete unsenectomy starts off a good day. And dissecting the unsnet process all the way laterally to the lacrimal bone. If you expose the lacrimal bone, nobody really worries about that because there's no cilia on the lacrimal bone that's functional to clean any sinus. And so finding the lacrimal bone and dissecting right up against it is gives you this wide open space. Leaving a part of the unsnet process against the lacrimal bone can also obstruct the natural ostium. And so complete unsenectomy is super, super crucial. And that's one of the things you'll see us go around is that we'll come on in and when you ask us for something, we'll quite often we'll go back in and many of us as instructors will start doing the surgery again by taking your unsnet bone remnant out for you and then you'll go, oh, I didn't see I left that there. The shaver, quite often will push the uncinet bone into the natural ostium. So using a through cut instrument, a backbiter, a 90 degree adult, a maxillary sinus seeker to swing the uncinet bone 
out away from the ostium and towards you before you're taking it down versus using a sickle knife or a shaver actually pushes the unset bone towards the natural ostium. So eversion of the unset bone, super important. And identifying each of these landmarks as we go from front to back. The next we're gonna look for is our ethmoid bulla. So we've taken down our unset bone and then we're looking for our ethmoid bulla behind that and identifying the ethmoid bulla and then going behind the ethmoid bulla and saying, here's this large grape, mango, watermelon. We can punch into it and remove it by pieces, but what I do is I reach behind it with a curette and I pull the entire unset, the entire unset forward and I do the same thing for the ethmoid bulla. Again, I don't shave the ethmoid bulla. I just reach behind it between the basal lamella of the middle turbinate and the ethmoid bulla, if you put a curette, a navigation probe, anything behind here, and just rotate and pull it down, the ethmoid bulla just falls down in front of you. If you punch, quite often you're punching it upwards, you're pushing it upwards, and then you have a whole bunch of bony fragments to take down. A retro bulla ethmoid eversion, simple technique, super easy, exposes the basal lamella of the middle turbinate. Once you find the basal lamella of your middle turbinate, then everything is super easy. You've done basically the ethmoidectomy, unsynectomy, identified your natural ostium, and you can come forward and go to your frontal sinus at that point. You can even enter your frontal sinus by leaving your ethmoid bulla intact because your ethmoid bulla basically is a landmark for the frontal recess, or you can go backwards and then come forwards. gone again. So here is um, a cross-sectional anatomy. In this patient, we come in, our inferior turbinate, we can see the ethmoid bulla right here, the unsynectomy has been removed, and basically what you're trying to do is reach behind the ethmoid bulla into this space called the retrobulla recess and pull the ethmoid bulla forward. After you've done that, you've got your basal lamella, your superior turbinate, your sphenoethmoidal recess, and this is the pathway of dissection either this way, this way, or this way. As you enter into the posterior ethmoids over the basal lamella of the middle turbinate, using a zero degree scope really points you in this direction. And really where you want to be going is this direction. So I encourage you to, once you enter the basal lamella of the middle turbinate, convert from a zero degree scope to a 30 degree scope. I actually don't use a zero degree scope anymore. I use the 30 degree scope for the retrobular recess. I rotate the 30 degree scope and look at the natural ostium. And then I turn the 30 degree scope upside down, put the scope up towards the frontal recess, skull base, and then you kind of fly over your basal lamella and down towards your sphenoid sinus. If you use a zero degree scope, you're trying to do this up and over and down, and you're not going upwards. So unsynectomy, straightforward procedure, creates a removal. If you push the unsynect bone, you put the shaver hair and you try to remove it, quite often you're pushing this inwards, while if you reach behind it and pull it out, that will make a big difference. So evert your unsynect process, and you can do that with several different tools. Once you've everted your unsynect process, you can see the natural ostium quite easily. And quite often, this will guide you up into your frontal recess, using the unsynect process as a frontal sinus dissection. Here's a patient who presents with prior surgery on the left, unsynectomy, unsynectomy, left behind. Basically, the patient had a dissection where they entered the fontanelle but left the unsnet process behind. This sets the patient up for maxillary sinus mucus recirculation with persistent disease, and all this requires is a good unsynectomy, bringing the middle turbinate towards the septum, identifying the unsnet bone, and resecting it from top to bottom in both directions there, using a seeker to reach behind it and just pull it forward. After an unsynectomy, you're going to look for the natural ostium. Quite often, there may be a Haller cell. Hopefully, you had identified that on your preoperative evaluation of the patient. Your note says, look for Haller cell. Requires you to put a 30, 45, or 70 degree scope to look in and go, oh, that looks like the maxillary sinus, but really isn't. 
So now I've got to dissect between the superior aspect of the inferior turbinate to find the space here to go up and over and pull this bone out. With resection of Haller cells, be aware that quite often they will insert on an infraorbital nerve. So putting a shaver over to shave away a Haller cell can sometimes damage the infraorbital nerve or branches of the infraorbital nerve. Using a frontal sinus dissection tool, a through cut and punch, um, to dissect down the Haller cell with a 70 degree scope is a great way to approach the Haller cell versus a shaver or a blunt instrument. Once you've done your maxillary dissection, your unsynectomy, you now have your ethmoid bulla, and going between the middle turbinate and the ethmoid bulla will give you spaces that you can see these planes of dissection. Planes of dissection we use for neck dissection, where we say, okay, let me find a sternocleidomastoid, let me put my fingers between here and move tissue around. Think about the same thing when you're doing FES. Find a plane of dissection between the middle turbinate, the middle turbinate basal lamella, the ethmoid, finding the space between your posterior ethmoids and your superior turb. These, these spaces that are like planes of dissection, if you find them, it makes the surgery way easier. Once you've found the ethmoid bulla, you can head upwards. You may have a retrobular recess. You may have a superorbital ethmoid cell, dissecting the, those out one by one. The ethmoid bulla, most of us think, just get it out of the way. I think of it as when you combine it with the middle turbinate basal lamella, it, gives you everything you really need to know. It orientates you upper or lower. You heard the previous talk about the key landmarks that you need to find. Quite often, I will leave the ethmoid bullet in place for my frontal sinus dissection, my maxillary sinus dissection, because it's the eye protector. It will just be like a gauze against the eye, keeping that orientation for me, allowing me to stay low, allowing me to stay into the anterior aspect of the frontal recess. Once I take down the ethmoid bulla, I want a complete resection of that ethmoid bulla. So now I have a huge space laterally and a huge space vertically to dissect down through. Here is that retrobular recess space. And it's basically a key anatomical landmark for your anterior posterior dissection. And quite often we just blow straight through it. And if you go fast and you blow straight through it, you're going to really damage the posterior wall of the uh, orbital cavity. Finding the basal lamella, basal lamella, middle turbinate in the retrobular recess allows you not only to find the anterior portion of your medial orbital wall, but stop and then find the posterior portion of your medial orbital wall after you've gone through the basal lamella of the middle turbinate. So this is a go, 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 stop go, 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 but knowing that you've identified the medial orbital wall here after you've passed the basal lamella. The basal lamella of the middle turbinate inserts on the medial orbital wall. So if you're like, where's the medial orbital wall? I don't know where it is. Back up, okay? Here's my unsynet region. Here's my middle turbinate. Here's my medial orbital wall. Let me go across this. Let me put the scope over. Ah, there's the medial orbital wall. Now I can use that as an anatomical landmark to dissect posteriorly through the posterior ethmoids. So, retrobular recess, once you've found that, you now have entered into the posterior ethmoid cells. But still keep the middle turbinate in mind, because now the middle turbinate basal lamella becomes a key anatomical landmark for your posterior ethmoid cell dissection. And look at the middle turbinate in three different planes. Also on your images, you can do this ahead of time, realizing that the middle turbinate will orientate you to your skull base, the middle turbinate will orientate you to your posterior and superior anterior ethmoids. The middle turbinate will insert towards the sphenopalatine artery. That's where it gets its blood supply from. And the axial component will insert into the lateral nasal attachments. So here we have our dissection again. Inferior turbinate, natural ostium. The unsynet process is gone. Here's the unsynet process remnant down here. Our ethmoid bulla, our middle turbinate, the sphenopalatine is going to be here. The basal lamella of the middle turbinate is here, inserting up onto the skull base, anterior to the ethmoid bulla, and the middle turbinate basal lamella is going to be our frontal recess, and posterior to this is going to be our posterior ethmoid cells going up, over, and down towards our sphenoid sinus. So middle turbinate, super crucial anatomical landmark. Again, the concept of a straight scope versus a 30-degree scope that will allow you to look down. This is the region of the sphenoid 
osteum. Quite often, this could be quite high. And sometimes people are like, I can't find this sphenoid sinus osteum. And a third degree scope, again, behind your superior turbinate or after you've resected portion of your superior turbinate will help you find the natural osteum. Sphenopalatine artery, the next speaker is going to cover this. After you've done your anterior ethmoid, middle turbinate, maxillary sinus, you then identify your superior turbinate, and then you say, okay, now I'm going to dissect from posterior to anterior. You may have opened your frontal recess, as I said before. So you have a sphenoid opening, a frontal sinus opening, and now you're doing your completion ethmoidectomy. Completion ethmoidectomy is the anxiety-provoking portion of the procedure for some people. It's also where um, remnant ethmoid cells are quite often left behind. Key at this point is to stop and pack off your boxes. So put some cotinoids in your maxillary sinus, put some cotinoids in your anterior ethmoids, put some cotinoids in your posterior ethmoids, and now you're an hour and a half into the surgery, your lidocaine's not working anymore, the anesthesiologist has brought the blood pressure up and down, there's blood in the field, flush it out, pack it off, go check your Facebook, go pee, come back, take out those cotinoids, and you're like, oh, this looks really nice. I can see the skull base. If this patient has a lot of polyps in there, that cotinoid packing actually compresses the polyps. And so you've done a polypectomy by compressing polyps. And when you take those cotinoids out, you're like, oh, where did the polyps go? You basically just pop them with your cotinoids. Your medial orbital wall will look beautiful. And then you say, now I've got my medial orbital wall. Now I've got the anterior face of my sphenoid. My posterior to anterior dissection has been compressed. My anesthesiologist realized that I had to go pee and do my Facebook. He or she thought I was pissed off at their blood pressure. They brought it down, and now you've got this beautiful feel. You've got the frontal sinus open, the sphenoid sinus open, and you just go, oh, I just have three ethmoid partitions to take down. Usually one is associated with the posterior ethmoid uh, complex and artery, and you use a through cutter to take that down with an angle scope. There's usually another one associated with portions of the middle turbinate basal lamella, and then you have your frontal recess cells to dissect out. So the posterior to anterior dissection is basically identifying branches of the posterior ethmoid artery, the shape of your skull base, and the anterior ethmoid artery. Those three things that all have associations with the medial orbital wall. If your medial orbital wall was not completely dissected, it's oozing, you want to complete that dissection, hopefully not with a shaver pointing towards the medial orbital wall, but a shaver parallel to the medial orbital wall or a through cut in device parallel to the medial orbital wall. You now enter into your agonizing region and you start your frontal recess dissection. Mm -hmm. Other ethmoid cells to be aware of um, that you sometimes will miss. So here's a, a revision patient again, septum, septum, middle turbinate stump. And you look in this region and you say, oh, there's the pathway to the frontal sinus. So a thin frontal sinus pathway that goes over the eye is usually a superorbital cell. And when you look at your axial images, you may say this guy is a frontal sinus, open and clear. This guy has a horizontal partition in the axial image. And that horizontal partition is one of two things. It's a ethmoid cell partition, or it's the anterior ethmoid artery that you're looking at. So a superorbital cell is a cause for recurrent disease, quite often. During the ethmoidectomy and going into the frontal recess, as we're dissecting, we may push portions of the ethmoid recess, frontal recess cells, into the superorbital ethmoid cell, and then close off the superorbital ethmoid cell. Patient gets a clear frontal sinus, but then they've got this thing above their eye, and that's a superorbital ethmoid cell that's a pacified. Key for a superorbital ethmoid cell dissection is to identify it preoperatively. Know it's there. So once you know it's there, you know you now have two frontal sinuses to dissect out on that side. One is the true frontal sinus, and the other one is the superorbital ethmoid cell. Usually the superorbital ethmoid cell is the more easy one to identify. However, it is also associated with the anterior ethmoid artery. So if you have a superorbital ethmoid cell, quite often you have an exposed anterior ethmoid artery. And so you have to find the anterior ethmoid artery to open your superorbital ethmoid cell. Did I go too fast over that? Everybody's got that one? Questions on the superorbital ethmoid cell? 
you'll have some. If you don't have some in your cadaver, look around and see if somebody else has a superorbital ethmoid cell. It's a very common cause for failure. The anterior ethmoid artery, we all worry about this, but we all did head and neck surgery, and we all had facial nerves that we had to dissect around. Key with this is to identify it preoptively again, and then identify it in its relationship to the medial orbital wall, the skull base, and the cribriform plate, all done preoptively. You've got a roadmap. If you don't find your anterior ethmoid artery before di doing dissection, you're just really asking for trouble. It's the one region where you can get three complications with one bite of an instrument. If you bite the anterior ethmoid artery, you can get an orbital bleed. At the same time, you can get an intracranial bleed, and at the same time, you can get a CSF leak. So all three can occur with one bite of one instrument. The artery can pull into the eye, the artery can pull into the brain, and the artery can then lead to a crack of the cribriform plate where the artery goes in to the brain next to your olfactory groove. Hopefully, you can cauterize it with a bipolar, you can put pledgets on it, it will chill out. Sometimes it's not the artery, it's the branch of the artery. Um, or, if necessary, you may have to actually repair the CSF leak at the same time. Now, that's just something if you had identified it, avoid it, it would be really, really great. We've heard about the ethmoid roof configurations. Again, this is something that you should really have side-by-side -side comparisons. And that's why the three-by-five card with a line through it is good, because every skull base, every ethmoid roof may look very different between patients. And so knowing that ahead of time, when you finish with the left side, you look at your three-by-five card, you go, OK, that, that's a Keras 2, now I'm going over to the right side, that's a Keras 3 with a frontal recess cell, let me start my dissection on that side. It's just a moment to pause, think about it, and say, what do I do next? Questions? So key points, angle scopes, dissecting in boxes versus tunnels, and then pausing as you get to the posterior aspect of your dissections.